You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Professor David Dima. Professor Dima is a research professor in the Department of Biomolecular Engineering and Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research interest is how cellular life arose on the Earth nearly 4 billion years ago. This research involves studies of meteorites that contain organic carbon compounds and self-assembly of complex lipid protein structures that exhibit some of the properties of life. Today's video was created in partnership with Forio Sweden. We often detail many new advances in science and technology on Event Horizon, so I'm happy to talk to you about a company that has brought together wellness and technology with a clear and unique vision. Forio's skincare uses T-sonic pulsations with microcurrent technology to massage and improve blood flow through the layers of your skin. The microcurrents use a low voltage electrical current to lift your skin while also massaging the facial muscles. I received and used the Bear device by Forio, which was the world's first FDA cleared medical microcurrent device with an anti-shock system that really does a fantastic job at visibly improving signs of aging and providing such a wonderful and gentle firming of the over 60 muscles in the face and neck. They have dozens of facial and silicone devices, but this Bear by Forio microcurrent device is a truly brilliant, groundbreaking gadget that you can get for someone you love. So if you're always worried about finding a perfect present for an anniversary, a birthday, or you've just missed your 8th Valentine's Day in a row. This is a perfect gift for your significant other. Be sure to click on the link in the description box and use code EVENT20 to get the Bear device. Dr. David Deemer, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Doctor, one thing that you worked on extensively that's very close to my own heart as a meteorite enthusiast now for 35 years is a meteorite fall that happened in 1969, not long after the moon landing. Very important year for space science it sure in was. Murchison, I think, New South Wales, Australia. But the Murchison meteorite showed us that organic chemistry is you ubiquitous in the solar system, perhaps from cometary material. Could you give us an overview of your work with the Murchison meteorite? I sure can. I'm going to go just to this little shelf behind me and pull out a vial, and that's a good place to start. Okay, John, this uh, vial is labeled Murray Drydown. Uh, Murray was a, another meteorite that fell in the same year as Murchison. It's also carbonaceous, and it may even come from the same asteroid that are that produce meteorites by conflict, by colliding with one another. So let me uh, open it up here, and I'm going to give it a smell, and I'm going to tell you what I smell. So this is dried down, and the aroma is a dusty, slightly acidic, kind of a sour aroma. And I know what's in it because this is extracted from a meteorite, carbonaceous meteorite, like the Murchison. The dusty smell is what we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It's the same stuff that comes out in diesel smoke and smoke from cigarettes and so forth. These are the so-called PAHs. And this uh, meteorite, these meteorites are loaded with PAH in the form of a polymer we call carrageen. And that's really about 90% of the kinds of organic molecules. But we can't smell those because they don't evaporate. They're too large and uh, almost like plastic. But what I do smell is these pieces of, of these, the polycyclic compounds, along with acids. So this meteorite contains uh, what we call monocarboxylic acids. And they range up to about 12 carbons in length, and they are basically soaps. So one of the things I did years ago now, 1985, was to take this stuff 
and put it under the microscope and interact it with water. And I was astonished to see beautiful little membranous vesicles appear. I raced out of my office where I was looking at this and down to where some of my colleagues were having lunch. I said, look, look, this is the membranes coming out of a meteorite that's 5 billion years old. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, well, that's a good day. They go back to their lunch. It slowly has made an impact. And I think that these days, most people agree that stuff like this is as close as we're going to get to what was available on the early Earth. And these soap-like molecules have the ability to assemble into membranous vesicles. And that's really been part of my life right from my PhD. In fact, I was working on stuff that would make membranes. So uh, to answer your question, I love meteorites too. The carbonaceous meteorites are particularly interesting because they are a way to deliver organic compounds to the Earth today as we speak. Organic mon com uh, compounds over 5 billion years old are being delivered to the Earth, both on meteorites, on what we call interplanetary dust particles. Probably most of this comes in on these IDPs, something like 30,000 tons of IDPs fall to Earth every year. And they carry a lot of carbon in as well. So that's uh, just the beginning of my story. And I hope I responded to your question about meteorites. Oh, quite so. Now, self-assembly of membranes could be one of the major keys to how prebiotic chemistry moves into microbes. Now, exactly. so. you did an experiment at a hot spring in, I think, Kamchatka in, in uh, Russia, not far from Alaska, actually, in a very volcanic place. And hot springs seem to maybe be key to the formation of membranes, which could come and become cell membranes. What does that mechanism look like? I've uh, encouraged my colleagues to step out of the laboratory and take a look at what we call prebiotic analog sites. And these are volcanic hydrothermal fields, what we call hot springs in uh, normal language. And they are hot. <laughs> they have water. The water is fresh water because it's being supplied by distilled water from the ocean. And if water evaporates, it falls as snow and ice and as, and as rain, of course. So volcanic land masses like Hawaii, like uh, Iceland, like Kamchatka in Russia, all have these hot springs. So I sort of took, took that prescription that I gave my colleagues and tried it out myself. I took what we call a prebiotic soup, at least the dry components of a prebiotic soup, to a little hot boiling puddle on the slopes of Mount Matnovsky in Kamchatka. And this was back in 2004. And I wanted to see what happens to the amino acids that were in this soup, to the nucleobases that are the bases of DNA and RNA, to a phosphate, a glycerol, and a fatty acid, a 14-carbon fatty acid that can form membranes called meristic acid. So I dumped that in, and every few minutes to every hour to even a couple of days later, we took samples of this hot spring. There's a little enclosed thing, about 10 liters of boiling water just heated from underneath by the uh, magma. So what we found is that the clay in the pool absorbed everything that I had added except for the meristic acid, this membrane forming stuff, and it formed a kind of a white froth around the borders of the pool, where the pool was in fact evaporating. And that gave me the idea that I'm still pursuing today, and that is that life did not begin in the sea, in the ocean, as we all had thought. With one exception, by the way, Charles Darwin said, guess that life began in a warm little pond. And boy, that was really prescient. So we call this Darwin's hot little puddle. You know, that's what it is, a boiling puddle. And it goes through wet, dry cycles. And when it dries out, 
everything gets concentrated as a thin film of organic material. And if there are compounds that can react, they will react because they're very concentrated in this organic film. And that's the next part of my story that I'm gonna get onto. But I'll just pause and say, that's why I was in Kamchatka, dumping a prebiotic soup into a little hydrothermal field. You probably know where I'm going next, wet, dry cycles and more about that, because that seems to have been instrumental in creating the conditions for life to arise. And we'll get into all kinds of stuff, your ability and all kinds of uh, things later. But sure. that wet, dry cycle, what is the importance to that in your model of abiogenesis? Yeah, be happy to tell you about that. So the first thing that happens during the drying process is that everything gets more and more concentrated. And these things, uh, probably on the early earth and in that little puddle that I poured the soup into, that's fairly dilute. There's 10 liters of water. And I just put in a few grams of these organic compounds like amino acids and so forth. So as it dries out around the edge of the pool and perhaps the entire puddle dries out, it gets extremely concentrated. So that's one thing that's very important that can happen on land, but not in the ocean. The ocean down deep where all those hydrothermal vents are, it never goes through a drying process. So the question is, how can things dry out to that down there? How can they get concentrated? Well, it's easy on a volcanic landmass. And I've challenged my guys that I know very well that are in the business of hydrothermal vents, and they really don't have an answer. They say, well, maybe it gets absorbed to the minerals, but that's a big maybe. I can show them concentrated stuff in my hydrothermal springs you know, as they go through a drying process. So the other thing that happens is that these are hot springs. Now, if you're an organic chemist and you want to speed up your reaction, you heat it up. And if you go into any organic clem lab, you can see things bubbling away. And the reason is to add activation energy. As you heat it, all those reactions go faster. If you keep it cold, nothing much happens. They don't have that energy to get over that little hurdle that allows them to react. So that is the two points that goes on in my mind as I visualize what would be happening on the early earth. The hot springs will concentrate, otherwise dilute organics. It'll heat them up and give them this extra energy so they can begin to react. And when they react, really interesting chemistry begins to happen. And we represent the end result of that really interesting chemistry, perhaps. Now, this would have implications on astrobiology in general, in that we could ask the question, okay, if it has to happen on dry volcanic land with hot springs, not only do you just need liquid water, but you need liquid water under a certain circumstance. In other words, ocean worlds, ice shell moons like Europa or Enceladus may not really be that ideal for the formation of life, greatly constraining what we think of as how life could arise, right? Yeah, you've been doing your reading. That's just great. We are on record saying that we are, I think it's implausible that life could begin on one of these cold ocean worlds like the moon Enceladus and Europa. These are moons that have a thick layer of ice, literally kilometers thick, with another layer that is liquid water. We're just really quite confident in that now. So they might be habitable. And this is a, an important point. If a microbial life could be delivered to a world like that, it might be able to pick up the nutrients and the energy down in that ocean so that it could actually thrive. And life does that here on Earth. We know that life can survive at zero degrees. And we can go to these ski areas and you see the kind of a pinkish color to some of the snow. That's a, a microorganism growing there. So Enceladus might be habitable, but I would say it's unlikely to be herbal. We have this new word we've invented, which says the planet is herbal, herbal, U-R-A-B-L-E, herbal. My spell checker keeps saying durable, and I have to go in back and erase the D. But uh, herbility is the properties, and these are complex mixture of properties. 
not just liquid water, like habitability, but a lot more to it. More complicated than we could have ever imagined, really, because we've always been talking for the last, what, uh, uh, decades about habitability, but that's a little bit too simplistic, hence the introduction of the word urability. But there is a shining, interesting example here of a second urable planet early in its history in our star system, and that is Mars. There was once a time where Mars could be characterized as urable. So what happened to Mars in your view that made it non-urable? Now, I'm not saying about, you know, the specifics. We all know that Mars got cold, lost its atmosphere and all that, but what made it specifically non-urable? Well, early Mars, and we're on record about this, has all the stuff that would require for urability. That an infall of uh, meteoritic uh, material providing organic compounds. It had liquid water, it's probably salty liquid water. It had volcanic activity. The biggest volcano in the solar system is uh, Ma Mons Olympus on Mars. And boy, it is the size of France, if you can imagine that. So it had all the stuff, but it dried out. It did not have the gravitational field required to keep gas around in the upper atmosphere. So all of the water vapor and other light gases tended to literally evaporate into outer space. The molecules reached escape velocity because of the heat they contained and away they went, leaving Mars high and dry. So Mars became inurable. It's very interesting that the Earth also became inurable as life developed on Earth. And Darwin put his finger on this. He said if life tried to develop again on Earth, it would be devoured by the very active microbial mass that now inhabits the Earth along with us. So I don't think life could begin again on the Earth for at least that reason. Everything required for life to begin is also a nutrient. And we are infested with microbial species that just love to eat the nutrients that they find laying around on the earth. And that they do. Now, Charles Darwin was very prescient, as you've noted, that this would have been what, 1860s, 1870, somewhere in thereabouts? 18, that 1871. 1871. So we were talking in some capacity about a suspicion of urability that early, which serves to help define that word, which is a new word. What exactly was it about did, did it start there? I mean, were you thinking about Darwin's statement when you started wondering about this and going into it, or did you find that later and find inspiration from it? Yeah, I ran across that uh, quote pretty early. It would be back in the 1980s, maybe, when I got more closely involved with NASA as a, a funding source and also as a group of people that shared my own interest. So uh, that's a famous quote and it's even used in the title of a book by Claire Folsom, A Warm Little Pond. And it just has struck all of us in the field uh, how amazing it was that uh, Darwin was talking about a protein in this warm little pond. And he talked about how the protein could undergo a kind of a molecular evolution, just to show you how far ahead of his colleagues he was. And by the way, he didn't really publish this this is in a letter to he wrote to his friend and colleague, Joseph Hooker, in 1871. And he was just kind of speculating off the top of his head uh, that this might have been a place where life could begin. But he had it all put together in his head, and we still use it as a touchstone for us as we think about the same sorts of problems. Absolutely amazing that the idea showed up that early. And sometimes, uh, you know, we lose track of ideas in science and <laughs> come across them again later and they turned out that they were prescient. Now, this warm little pond, all right? So we have the Big Bang, then we have population three stars. We have all of this development of supernovas and everything populating the universe with heavier materials and organic chemistry and all of the things that happened. Could it be possible that a durable planet appeared before Earth, in your view, somewhere in the universe. When, when does our ability actually happen within our universe? Yeah, I think I agree with Carl Sagan. Billions and billions uh, uh, out there just waiting for us to find them one way or another, probably by uh, some of these wonderful new telescopes that are 
circling around the Earth. So there are almost certainly, as Mars as an example, early Mars was an herbal planet right in our own solar system. So as we look at other solar systems uh, with the amazing instruments that we now have available, we are seeing planets the size of Earth in the habitable zone where it's the temperature regime would be such that liquid water could be around for long periods of time. And that's that's very important, by the way. You can't just have a little bit of li li water and evaporates. We've got to give evolution and selection a time to go through this lengthy process that it did on Earth. It probably took about half a billion years to get from the time that the Earth accreted as a red hot planet after the moon forming event and cooled down enough so the ocean formed maybe about uh, 300 million years after the earth actually accreted and then at about four billion years that's our guess at the time that the most primitive life began to get started on the early earth and another half billion years life was here microbial life was making stromatolites on the shores of the land masses that we now call Australia. So we know that life was around. We see little microfossils uh, from that time as well. So that's so that's about what it took, say a billion years from the actual formation of the Earth to the first life that we are certain was there. That's a long time. So the water was there for at least half that time because uh, life could not begin without liquid water and life could not exist today without liquid water. Do you see interesting geology on Mars that tantalizes you to suspect that maybe something was going on there? Yeah, if uh, I sure do. <laughs> the Spirit rover years ago now found a place that they called Home Plate. Because it looked kind of like it was in the Columbia Hills and it's kind of like the the base home plate, except it was 100 meters across or thereabouts. And on home plate, one of my colleagues, Steve Ruff at Arizona State University, was looking through the photographs we have coming back to us from that particular rover. And he saw beautiful little sort of nodular structures that he immediately recognized as the sort of thing that we see here on Earth, as evaporating hot springs. That is really wonderful that we now know that there were probably volcanic areas that were going through these wet dry cycles and they left behind these actual deposits that we now recognize as nodular structures that appear as hot springs on Earth go through a drying process. So that's where I would go again. My group, by the way, was a member of the team that sent Perseverance off to uh, the Jezreel crater. And they went. They wanted to go there for several reasons. One, it used to be a lake, and there's uh, rivers kind of running into it, as far as we could tell from what we see from uh, our orbiting satellites. And there was uh, there's sedimentary deposits that look like, like uh, stuff is settling out of of water masses and producing these layers that we see all over Mars. In fact. Uh, Mars was uh, kind of not as wet as the Earth, but uh, they had several hundred meter deep seas. And that would be a very nice place, along with volcanic areas that came up out of those seas and allowed a distilled water to form these hot springs that we think were involved in the origin of life. The presence of the wet and dry cycle, right? Yeah, and cycle. It's not just one. You don't just dry it down, period. It does it again and again and again. And this is like a metaphorical pump. You're pumping those organic molecules. Each wet dry cycles, things become more and more complex. So when we run it in the laboratory, we will run it for as short as a few wet tricycles where we get interesting products. And uh, the people at McMaster University have a simulation chamber that goes all the way up to oh, 100 cycles, 200 cycles, and other things begin to happen when you have that much uh, cycling occurring. So you have to pump the system uphill 
toward complexity, and you anchor that complexity in bigger molecules that are less likely to undergo hydrolytic degradation. We call that a kinetic trap. And I want you to think about this. All life on Earth lives in a kinetic trap. And what that means is that we make our complex polymers faster than they degrade by hydrolysis. When we take a shower, we don't dissolve completely. <laughs> a little bit of skin tissue probably goes down the drain, but it's quickly in days is replaced by the dermal layer of our epidermis. So that's really what we have to keep in mind, that on the early Earth, there were also kinetic traps. And that is that you could quickly drive a molecule up toward a more complex structure, and it would stay up there for long enough to become functionally active. So that's what goes on in my mind when I think about the first steps of evolution. You have to get up to a relatively stable organic material that is sufficiently complex, for example, to be a catalyst. Does that introduce the idea of self-extinction of life? Meaning if it can't achieve that, be based on the conditions of the planet, the conditions of the chemistry, could you have sputtering life where it simply, it, it occurs, but then it can't quite reach that level of being able to repair itself essentially. And can that cause a situation where you have almost erability, meaning a planet that produces multiple abiogenesis one after the other, but they get short circuited somehow, then maybe in that chemical process, they just can't get going and it just never really happens. So you mean getting all the way up to a primitive? Yeah, place, right. As you're talking yep. about. Yeah, we think that very likely happened on the early Earth, that life was a sort of a global experiment. And some of the experiments would be more successful than others because it lacked some urability factor that was absolutely necessary to pick up and, and stay alive, as it were. It could be as simple as drying out and staying dried out so that you have this slow degradation because chemical bonds, complex molecules do tend to break down. You know, we have these uh, DNA molecules from Neanderthals, literally molecules from Neanderthals. And that's how we know much more about our ancestors than we could have ever imagined. But they're all broken up into little fragments just by the fact that they're hanging around. They are warm and dry, but still the chemical bonds will break this degradation process. And then I guess you have the question of star type, because if you have too much ultraviolet radiation, say from a red dwarf or a type F star, this may not be able to happen even on an otherwise herbal world, right? Yeah, we've thought about that. Uh, it only takes a little bit of shade when you think about it. <laughs> get out of the uh, get out of the uh, UV light. But you're right that UV light is a selection factor, and it's uh, it works in human beings. Uh, skin coloration has to do with uh, UV light and the cancerous transformations it can occur if you get too much of it. We probably all suffered from sunburn at one time or another. And that's an effect of uh, certain portions of the UV spectrum affecting a molecule called thymine, which is one of the molecules in DNA. When thymine is two of them are next to each other, two thymines are next to each other, they get activated when they absorb UV light and they form a crosslink between the two molecules. It's called a thymine dimer. And this kills the DNA. An enzyme trying to use that DNA as a source of information uh, gets blocked by the fact that it was the two of the thymines are jammed together. So that's all the way up to us. The complexity of a human body is dealing with UV damage and radiation. And the same would be true on the early Earth. UV would be shorter wavelengths, like UV is a shorter wavelength. And the shorter the wavelength, the more energy it has. That light will bind to a molecule, it'll be absorbed by it, it'll activate the electronic structure, and often enough, bad things will happen to that molecule. Back to membranes and the formation of them. What mechanism does this have in relation to DNA? Meaning, do these, these membranes, are they the precursor of life that allows for the chemistry of DNA, however that happens? RNA. Does that give it a sort of environment, a protected environment in which to exist? 
in the laboratory, well, I, I have to add something here. In our laboratory, we're very interested in a plausible mechanism by which nucleic acids could have been produced on the early Earth before life existed. And we're finding ways that nucleic acids, things like DNA and RNA, can be produced by wet dry cycles. And the reasoning for that is fairly high level chemical reactions. It has to do with what are called condensation reactions. So you imagine my hand, my two hands here, and these are molecules wandering around in solution. And as they get drier, as they get dry out, they get closer and closer together. And pretty soon they're touching each other and they're very close in the dried state. At that point, if there is an OH group, a hydroxyl group, and a acidic group like a phosphate, a molecule of water can pop out of that neighboring molecules and make an ester bond. So our DNA and our RNA are polyesters. It's really amusing to think that we all know about polyesters because they're all of our clothing and so forth. But the fact is that our nucleic acids are also polyesters. They're being held together by a bond that occurs between a ribose sugar and a phosphate on a neighboring nucleotide molecule. So what we're discovering in wet dry cycling is that bond forms spontaneously. As it gets super dry, water becomes what we call a leaving group and evaporates from this thin film of organics and leaves behind ester linkages. And we are now seeing the polymers by a process called atomic force microscopy. Our most recent paper in 2022 shows images of the polymers that we're producing coming out of a simple mixture of nucleotides, mononucleotides, going through several wet dry processes. And these polymers form, they get very long. Some of them are little ring-like structures. Some are just the long threads that we can see. That's being done with my colleague in Denmark, Tui Hassenkamp. And he's at the University of Copenhagen and specializes in atomic force microscopy. So when you get to the point that you can actually see the molecules that we're making, it gets more and more convincing that this would be an easy way for nucleic acids or molecules like them that with the similar properties to have been produced on the early Earth before life began. So we're now saying in our publications, we don't think that life invented nucleic acids. We think that life discovered pre-existing nucleic acids and in the presence of a membrane forming molecule like fatty acids, you are able to produce what we call a protocell. And a protocell is a membrane with a string of nucleic acids wound up inside, ready to begin the pathway toward selection and evolution. So we're making protocells in the laboratory. Every time we do these experiments, we're making trillions of protocells. Every one of them is different at the start from all the rest. But as time goes on, and as these populations undergo selection by the kind of stresses imposed by the environment, uh, at that point, they sort of get more and more complex. And finally, we hope we will find a way for them to reproduce in the laboratory. The very beginning of natural selection, right? Oh yeah, right at the start. Amazing. Now, let me ask you this. Durability and the past durability of Mars. What are your views on Venus? Do you think it has a shot at having once maybe had the same conditions? Yeah, at one time, Venus was very different from what it is now. Venus is close enough to the sun so that its ordinary sort of temperature is going to be elevated by a greenhouse effect. So it was probably warmer than uh, the Earth just right from the start, except for the moon forming event. The moon forming event melted the Earth and the moon. They were red hot for a while. Venus is kind of red hot now. It's up around 800 degrees C. 
But at the start, as it was accreting, it would have been relatively cool because it didn't have that greenhouse effect starting up. We on Earth escaped a Venusian greenhouse because we have an ocean. It had a place for all that CO2 to go and become mineralized and turn into limestone and be removed from our atmosphere. Venus was a little too hot to have much of a global ocean at the time. And so therefore it was never able to get rid of its carbon dioxide. Now it has a huge greenhouse effect. It lead would melt on the surface of Venus, just to show you how hot that is. One last little point on this. If we take all of the limestone that we know on the Earth today, that used to be CO2. If we could add acid to it and turn it back into CO2, it would have nearly as much CO2 as Venus does today in our atmosphere. And that's something we would not have ever had life begin on the Earth, except for the existence, long-term existence of, a, of liquid water. Yeah, and, and you, there's other questions within this. And the first one I wanna ask you about is salt. So salt seems to present somewhat of a problem to this chemistry, doesn't it? So in other words, that's another point against life having formed around the ocean vents in the, in the deep ocean, but yet life was able to colonize salt water thereafter. So in other words, it starts in a hot spring and ends up in an ocean. How's that happen? Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, so if life began, as we suggest, in a volcanic hot springs, it's above sea level. It's all downhill to the sea. So when we play with this in our heads, you know, and make up little images, we can imagine these uh, hot springs up on a place like Hawaii, for example, a nice fresh water coming down, feeding into it, all this stuff that we see happening in the laboratory now with uh, the formation of protocell. So it happened uphill from the ocean, and sooner or later, it gets into brackish water. It's going to have to make some adjustment at that point if it has already become alive in some sense. That means it can evolve. It can adapt to brackish water. And then it's going to hit salty seawater. And that is a problem. That's an extreme environment compared to these dilute hot springs up on the volcanic hillside. So the reason it's an extreme environment is twofold. One is that it's hypertonic, it's half molar sodium chloride. In our bloodstream, we're only 0.15 molar sodium chloride. So we're about a third the dilution of ocean water. And that's why, by the way, if you get stranded on a raft in the middle of the ocean, you could not drink that seawater because we don't have a way to get rid of all of that sodium chloride that you'd be taking in. So that's one problem. It's kind of an osmotic effect, we call it, where if you have a cell and expose it to a high salt solution, the cell shrinks and it loses its water and basically it can't do much about it. It's going to be a goner. So that's one problem. Another problem is the divalent cations present in seawater, but not in hydrothermal springs. These calcium and magnesium are up in the tens of millimolar range. Calcium is in fact 10 millimolar in seawater. It's magnesium about 53 millimolar. That makes it what we call hard water. If you ever try to wash your hands in seawater, it doesn't work very well because the soap turns in kind of a curd instead of having a nice slippery soapy feel. It's just a like <laughs> curds and whey, you know, cottage cheese. So that is the second problem. And the third problem you touched on it is thermodynamic. There's a huge thermodynamic barrier to getting molecules dry enough so that water can become a leaving group and form a peptide bond if you're to make a protein or a nucleic acid ester bond. So those are the three main problems that I see with a seawater origin. Now, my colleagues, I know them very well. I visited Nick Lane one for one in his lab in London, and it's a friendly collegial interaction. They are pursuing a different approach than we are. And they have come down now to the idea that, hot, that uh, hydrothermal vents 
might be a place where metabolism can start, but maybe not get all the way up to an origin of life with polymers and so forth. That's still in their conjectural range, that there might be a way for that to happen. But, you know, I buy into the chemistry they're trying to do. I've seen the things that Nick Lane does with uh, his laboratory simulations of this. It works. Uh, you can make a little bit of formic acid from carbon dioxide, but none of them have really gotten all the way up to all of the kinds of molecules that you can get just by meteoritic infall. So that's where I think an extraterrestrial carbon source might be a little bit ahead in the plausibility uh, factor. Now that gets back to Murchison's. So my question would be, it's comets, isn't it? It's the organic chemistry that happens on the surfaces of comets that seeded it. So we're back to that idea. Comets are an amazing amount of organic material in comets. A lot of that dust that we see coming out of the tail of a comet is full of polycyclic compounds. We know that there's uh, other uh, reactive organic compounds present. Cyanide is uh, present for example. But it's all pretty cold, it's a near outer space temperature. So it lacks that activation energy. And it also lacks uh, liquid water. You know, how is it going to react if it's uh, basically frozen in tiny particles that are being dispersed into space? So I don't think that life could begin on a comet, but I would be perfectly happy to say that if you could get a chunk of a comet and bring it to the Earth and put it into a flask and then put in some E. coli, you might very well get bacterial growth going. I'll bet that comet water is habitable, but it might not be herbal, at least in the sense of uh, out there in the cometary outer space. Now, this brings up questions of the Fermi paradox, because it seems to me that herbility would be a fairly reasonable solution for how life might be rare in the galaxy, or at least initially, early on, eventually get into panspermia and all these ideas, but, and alien civilizations moving around, but at least early on, and we're still fairly early in the history of the universe, that might answer the great silence is that it's just very situational on habitable worlds. They have to be arable, and therefore it shouldn't be surprising that we don't see much of it or any of it at this point. We've had that same thought. Uh, my colleague Bruce Damer and I gave a talk at SETI last month and uh, brought that up, that the Earth might be rarer than we can possibly imagine. Sagan says billions and billions, but uh, Peter Ward says rare Earth. The herbility factors might make it much rarer. And you know, it's really interesting, just psychologically. It's wonderful if the universe is filled with intelligent life and they're all trying to communicate with us. It's equally wonderful if we are the only intelligent beings in our galaxy. If that is true, we literally own the galaxy. Every person on Earth would own 20 stars. I've done this calculation and any planets around us. So all they got to do is get there and it's all theirs, you know? So uh, it's, it's equally interesting to be unique in our galaxy or to have millions of other civilizations out there. I only want my own star system. I don't need 20, so okay. I'll leave that for others. Uh, now, okay. well, that, that, that seems like a perfectly reasonable solution because it seems to fit everything that we see as small of a sampling as we have. It seems to fit. Now, of course, if the JWST starts seeing biosignatures or weird oxygen levels or things like that, then we might be in a different boat very quickly. But that brings us to the next thing, just after salt, the presence of poisonous, horrible oxygen that led to us and our evolution. But the earliest life on Earth, oh no. So oxygen was deadly poisonous to it, and we can blame the plants for oxygenating the atmosphere and poisoning the uh, anaerobes. That is another factor, is that if you have a, a planet that has some level of whatever the tolerance is of oxygen primordially from its formation, that's a showstopper for the earliest chemistry of life, right? Yeah, the early Earth was certainly anaerobic all the way up to what we call the Great Oxidation Event, uh, which is a couple billion years ago, say. Uh, cyanobacteria were the first microbial life that learned how to capture solar energy, the actual light hitting the Earth. And they began probably 
predating the great oxidation event, they became, they're probably responsible for it just by all the oxygen they're pouring out. But it has occurred to me and to others that oxygen was the first antibiotic, literally. It was being exuded by the cyanobacteria, and they probably decimated all the anaerobic life that was all around. And that's the idea. If you're a microbe, you want everything to yourself and you make antibiotics. And when oxygen popped out of the cyanobacteria, boy, that was a killer. So uh, the earth was probably kind of greenish uh, instead of bluish uh, when the cyanobacteria had really filled the oceans, for example, very successful microorganisms. But as that oxygen began to percolate up into the atmosphere, it allowed another form of life to begin, which was life that had learned how to take advantage of the immense chemical energy available when you get electrons from something like a carbohydrate or a fat and let those electrons go downhill to an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase in our mitochondria. And on the way downhill, each pair of electrons spins off the equivalent of three ATP molecules. It's really quite extraordinary that all that can happen. So I think I remember reading that one glucose can make 36 ATPs by the electrons that it can give off. Don't quote me on that figure. That's just out of biochemistry from years ago. But that's the deal. You know, we, you and me and everybody else, all the aerobic forms of life on the earth, we are using uh, oxygen as an energy source because that's as good as it gets. There's nothing better than getting electrons from something that's reduced to something, to oxygen itself, something that's oxidized. Now, there is a sort of elephant in the room with life on Earth, and that is chirality. Everything is of one chirality, homo chirality. But there's also the opposite. The opposite could happen. What effect does that have in your mind on abiogenesis? If you have both chiralities of molecules, similar molecules, can that confound the formation of life, the abiogenesis of life? And can it conceivably prevent it in a lot of cases, unless you have very special circumstances that allow only one-handed molecules to be available in the environment of the, uh, presumably the hot spring. I have another colleague, David Ross, who is a theoretical chemist. He's working with SRI International across the hill from us. Dave and I got together some years ago. He was interested in the thermodynamics that we were proposing uh, for the formation of nucleic acids, this condensation reaction that I told you about, and whether it could really happen, as we have suggested, as a, a way to make nucleic acids. So he was skeptical. And scientists are supposed to be skeptical. We're supposed to look on everybody else's ideas with a certain degree of skepticism. Karl Popper even invented a word. He said that a good hypothesis should be falsifiable. Notice you don't try to prove your hypothesis is correct. You test it to see if it can stand up to a crucial experiment that if it fails, it falsifies your hypothesis. And I really subscribe to that. That's what, what we do right from the start whenever we're thinking. The reason is that most of our ideas that occur in our head don't match reality when you test it experimentally. So uh, we began to think about that. And uh, it turns out that this is a possibly a special circumstance that you mentioned. I mentioned earlier, at some point, a big molecule can become more resistant to hydrolysis. And hydrolysis is the degradation reaction that we use in digestion. Digestion is a process of enzymes in the stomach and intestine using enzymes to hydrolyze all those bonds that hold proteins together and nucleic acids, ester bonds and uh, peptide bonds. So let's get broken in hydrolysis. So if you have a molecule like DNA and you have it wound up into a double helix, as we know DNA is, that double helix structure is more resistant to hydrolysis than a single strand of DNA or RNA. And the reason is pretty simple. 
water has to actually collide with an ester bond in order to begin the hydrolysis process. And if you hide that ester bond beneath a, a large molecule that kind of shields it from water, it's going to be more stable. And I've seen this happen. We do this in the lab. It's really pretty amazing to compare single-stranded hydrolysis to a double-stranded molecule. It's literally tens to hundreds of times slower. So you're going to start to select for double-stranded molecule right from the start because it protects the molecule from hydrolysis. But here's the but. That's a big one. Double-stranded molecules can only be stable if they are homochiral. If all of the sugars in a DNA, you know, the ribo deoxyribosis in it, if they are all D on both strands, that's a match. And it's very stable. It easily forms these hydrogen bonds that hold it together. But if you begin to throw in some L sugars, as Jerry Joyce did way back in the 1980s uh, down at uh, Salk Institute, he discovered that this gets completely mixed up and you cannot get a double strand to form very easily from racemic mixtures where you have a mixture of DNL molecules. So if that is true, and here's the last point that we are just now publishing, Dave Ross and I, and that is that if homochirality produces stable molecules, they will slowly be selected for compared to other molecules that are racemic and just trying to hang together as single strands. So those are going to be selected. And homochirality is a natural outcome of the double helical formation of things like nucleic acids. So that's the idea. It's a hypothesis. And we know how to test it. And at some point, I hope that I have a little time to get around to testing it. But we're throwing that out as an idea. It's already been published in one short paper. And we just a couple of days ago, I submitted another paper to a, an appropriate journal to get this out for people to think about. Much has been made over the many years that we've all been wondering about this, apparently since Charles Darwin, even before knowing about genetics, the idea of the RNA world. Now, how does that interlock with what you're saying? I mean, is is the is the RNA world a precursor in your mind, or is it just a red herring and it was a sort of separate sort of trajectory? Are we proceeding from RNA still and the RNA world, or do we begin to flirt here with a new model? Yeah, I don't think it's a red herring. What it was and still is, is a good testable hypothesis. It's falsifiable in Karl Popper's uh, terminology. So there's a bunch of stuff that fits the idea of an RNA world. Some of the strongest are that we see molecular fossils built into metabolism. So ATP, this prime energy source, that's a ribonucleotide. The ribosome that makes proteins, Harry Noller right here at UC Santa Cruz discovered that the ribosome is a ribozyme deep down where the amino acid transfer to a growing peptide chain. So that's not a protein enzyme that does that. It's really a leftover ribozyme. So that's the kind of stuff that is, has been discovered since the idea came along originally, which, by the way, was in the early 1980s when Tom Cech and Sid Altman and a couple of other people came up with ribozymes, the discovery that, in fact, RNA can have catalytic activity Boy, that was a biggie. Walter Gilbert immediately jumped on that. And even though he didn't do much of that work, he gave it the word. He said, it's as though life came from an RNA world. That was in 1986. And uh, by that time, uh, these guys had won the Nobel Prize for discovering ribozymes. So it's a wonderful idea. It fits, but there's a few little problems. There's no reason why it could not be a mixture of RNA and DNA from the start. Ram Krishnamurthy is now on record with the idea that it wasn't a pure RNA world, that DNA and other polymers were coming along for the ride, and they were available to do these kinds of molecular experiments. If one gets together with the other, maybe there's a synergy that happens that makes something happen faster, like a catalyst or information transfer, something like that. 
So all of these things are still pretty hazy. We're seeing through a glass darkly, as it's been said. Uh, we can see little funny blurred images down there in our imagination. So we're all playing with these ideas. And it is really fun, you know, thinking with ideas, as you well know, you're an idea guy, I can tell. It's fun to have that. And a few people really maintain that curiosity right to their 80s, like me. You know, I I go into the lab and I'm still wondering, is this going to work or not? Usually it doesn't, <laughs> but once in a while it does. Yeah, that's the key to life, though, yep. is to stay curious. Now, once life starts, once you get past the year ability and you end up with a, a planet like Earth that's sustaining life and habitable in the sense that it can sustain life, but it is no longer arable, life seems to be pretty tenacious once it gets to that point. So do you expect that, say we look out and we see we see a biosphere or something with JWST. This can only be a biosphere. There's some sort of photosynthesis going on because this planet should not be able to maintain its oxygen levels or these types of questions. Can we infer from that that it must be ancient and persistent? Certainly persistent and adaptive. Life has this wonderful ability, at least in the microbial world, to adapt to the most incredible environments we can imagine. We have hyperthermophiles that live up near boiling temperature in these hydrothermal springs that I visit on volcanoes. We have other microbial life that lives perfectly happy in the thin zero degrees Celsius water coating ice in snow, for example. We have acidophiles. We have hyperhalophilic bacteria that live in basically saturated salt solution. So life has explored extreme environments and life such as the organism that can survive many, many times the dose of radioactivity that will kill everything else. We know for a fact that its DNA gets knocked to pieces by this radiation and bombardment. But this little organism has discovered a way, it's called radiodurans, by the way, because it can be, it's durable. Dinococcus uh, radiodurans. That's right, you got it. And so here's another thing that has managed to live in things that we simply could not imagine 50 years ago before we began to understand uh, these extreme affiliate life. So uh, microbial life can do all this, but my guess is that when you get up to the complexity of eukaryotic life and on to multicellular life with the nervous systems, uh, it gets narrower and narrower, but we can withstand. And you and I can only go a few degrees above or below our optimum temperature, and we're gone, right? So uh, it's a, it gets easier and easier as time goes on for life to evolve at the microbial level, but it gets harder and harder for us as big complex organisms to find evolutionary pathways. I have to point out something poetic here. Our friend Dinococcus radiodurans has the ability to absorb the radiation levels that it can, which I believe are something like 25,000 times what a, what a human can withstand. And it did it through a dry cycle. It dries out. And its evolution was defined by being able to dry out, which in some poetic way mimics what you're describing about the wet and dry cycle. That's an interesting point. So uh, quite a few microbial organisms form spores. And the spores can, in fact, survive outer space conditions. One microorganism, the tardigrade, can actually uh, live in vacuum for a while. You know, we see them crawling around on scanning microscope imaging. So there are a few eukaryotes, multicellular, that really are surprisingly durable. And they do this by putting them, filling themselves up with a sugar called triolose. And that is a protective Thing that protects against ice damage and other kinds of damage, radiation damage, these sorts of things. So life has explored these extreme areas, but not very complex life. These are all very simple life that have very short generational times. There's lots of them all over the place, you know, experimenting, where can I live? But we're pretty well stuck with what we've got for our world. And we've come to dominate our world and we can stop being so stupid as to build, burn all this, you know, fossil fuel, we might even survive the next century. The natural question to ask here, of course, is about panspermia and the idea that maybe life on Earth is originally native to Mars. 
How likely do you think that is, that maybe life here began there? Yeah, I love to bring that up in my lectures, and I've got a little TEDx talk, and that ended up with the idea that uh, we could all be ancestral from Martians, Martian life, and people get a giggle out of that. But Steve Benner brought this up at an international scientific meeting, and uh, he's kind of on record that, according to his chemistry, he likes borate chemistry, According to his chemistry, Mars is a perfectly good environment for life to begin and then be delivered to the Earth as we know happens. I've held in my hand the Nakla meteorite. That's a piece of Mars. You know, it's really quite extraordinary. I've seen the uh, this sort of potato-shaped object, uh, you know, uh, 84001, you know, that Alan Hills. Earth suggested to be a fossilized life in it. So it, we know that, that can happen. And if we finally do find life on Mars, ooh, I do want to tell you how we, we think we might find it. I have a former grad student, Winona Verkater, over at NASA Ames. We've just sent a proposal into NASA Exobiology that we want to build a life detector for Mars that will search for polyanions. And this uses the other thing that has been very much part of my life, a nanopore. Now, a nanopore is a nanoscopic pore through a membrane that can accommodate just barely a nucleic acid molecule passing through from one end to the other. So if you uh, make uh, your thumb and fingers into a little circle like that, and you poke your finger through that, that's about what it looks like for a piece of DNA to pass through a nanopore. And it crowds out much of the water of the pore, and therefore we see what's called a blockade, a block sit for just a few milliseconds. And then at the bottom of the blockade, there is information having to do with the base sequence in the DNA. So we can now buy a nanopore sequencer. It's a little thing about the size of a cell phone. You plug it into a laptop, add your DNA, a little bit of preparation beforehand, and right away on your screen, you begin to see DNA molecules passing through the nanopore. We want to build one of those and send it off to a Mars lander. We're going to be looking not for DNA or RNA, but we're going to be looking for something that is a polyanion. See, DNA and RNA are polyanions. That means they carry a negative charge on every phosphate group. That is what pulls it through a nanopore because we've imposed a voltage. It's called electrophoresis. That pulls each molecule individually. If I saw a blockade in some Martian ice, I would be so ecstatic. That is the only thing I can think of that would explain that is a polymer like DNA or RNA. Could we link that once, say, say we take back the home world, so to speak, and go to Mars and you have scientists on the ground digging deep, looking at the Martian ice subsurface and they find something like that or they find even some evidence or remnant of DNA, you know, just broke down bits and pieces like what you might find in a mummified Egyptian body or something like that. Is, would it still be possible to potentially link it to life on Earth? I mean, could we say that is transplanted Earth life, therefore we must ask the question if we are originally from Mars, or that's truly alien life, that is a second abiogenesis in the solar system. Do you think that we would have hope with boots on the ground on Mars studying this to actually answer that question? Yeah, we sure can. Let me just give you a few ways to do that. The simplest and the quickest is whether it is a homochiral molecule that uses D sugar or L sugar. We think it was probably a flip of the coin with a little bit of um, moderation there, if I have, if I'm pressed on that question. It was probably a flip of the coin that the Earth ended up with D sugars and L amino acids as homochiral uh, structures. So suppose that we go to Mars, we find something that looks like DNA, but it has L sugar in it. That would suggest a separate origin of life. But it even gets better than that. Suppose we discover a D sugar DNA or RNA or a molecule like that, homochiral, and it has a recognizable genetic code that the same triplet code in the DNA codes for the same amino acid 
on Mars as on Earth. We would conclude pretty confidently that either Mars life came to the Earth or, less certainly, Earth terrestrial life got delivered to Mars because that is so improbable to have the same genetic code and the same chirality together. That would be convincing. Way beyond lottery odds for that one, I would imagine. Yeah. Now, in 1976, we sent the Viking missions, and I once interviewed Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt, who was the principal investigator of the labeled release experiment for that shortly before she passed away, unfortunately. And she maintained that, you know, maybe that detection on the surface of Mars was was real. Now, what do you think as a chemist that that of that experiment? Do you think that we should actually repeat the labeled release experiment in a more complex form to see if maybe somehow microbial life on Mars might actually exist on the surface of Mars or just below the surface. Yeah, everything that a working scientist does is based on judgment of plausibility. And that's an internal judgment. And my, my approach is to always stay with the plausible because there's so much to be discovered that doesn't require an implausible jump. So, but that's my personal approach to science is to stick with plausibility. We have other guys like Chandra Wickramasinghe, who jumps to the other possibility just because of his personality. I've, I've met him, I've seen him at meetings, and uh, we also had a conversation in Australia when we were, happened to both be at the uh, radio telescope at Tidbinbilla outside of Canberra. So it was really fun to talk to someone like Chandra because he loves ideas and almost the farther out the better so far as Chandra because it's more interesting to his, his mindset to uh, go with the less plausible stuff. So uh, to answer your question, I would take the evidence that we have on from the 76 experiments, you know, the uh, pioneer experiments there, the where, you know, a, a gas was released that could have been from some biological source, for example. Uh, in fact, there are other explanations that don't require a biological source. And we now know that some of the minerals on Mars, when mixed with water, will release some of these gases that were detected. And we have these perchlorates in the Martian, uh, which were unexpected at the time. So I will go with the weight of evidence. I think of all the evidence for and against, and then I make a plausibility decision on whether I want to personally work on that or not. And so I'm going to avoid working on things that I consider implausible, simply because they're less likely to have a usable end product and a satisfactory answer. Now we're nearing the end of the program, which is when I get to ask the crazy questions. There is a crazy moon known as Io that may have once had water. Do you think maybe that might be a fruitful place to look for some past occurrence of abiogenesis on this tidally flexed little world around Jupiter? Yeah, I think a lot of the planetary bodies in our solar system during accretion, where they started with little clumps called planetesimals that were colliding with each other. The planetesimals had water, ice embedded in uh, the, uh, the dusty material that formed them. And that water, ice, and the carbon dioxide and the other some uh, simple organic compounds just came, over, came along for the ride. But then some of them ended up as asteroids, and asteroids are sort of examples of planetesimals that did not make it all the way up to becoming part of one of the major planets. So you got to keep in mind that they have a history, and we can only guess at the history by deducing from what we know about physics and chemistry and geophysics and geochemistry. We can make good guesses about what the early Earth was like, for example, based on that. And we also can guess that uh, some of the asteroids, these planetesimals that did not get into a planet, uh, probably had hot interiors heated by radioactivity and it got hot enough for water ice to melt and probably came boiling out as steam, uh, kind of distilling material from inside these multi-kilometer sized objects depositing the stuff on the surface. It could be that meteorites carry a lot of the stuff to the Earth. So we're seeing the surface and not just a random chunk 
of an asteroid when we pick up a meteorite. Uh, we know that there's iron meteorites. That means that they got hot enough for iron and nickel to melt and turn into a nugget that comes to Earth as a uh, as a meteorite. So the, that early history could have passed through something that we might recognize as being erable, but it did not last very long. These things are small. They don't have much of a gravitational field. Uh, the atmosphere rapidly escapes into outer space. And so that time that they existed in an herbal state might not have been sufficient to give rise to a primitive form of life. Like in the last question, carbon seems to be the magic element as far as the chemistry of life is concerned because of its enormous ability of bonding with everything. But there's also been the question of silicon-based life, if you had to bet. Now, there isn't much chance, I think, for anything else on the periodic table, but, but silicon life, do you think that's possible? And would that alter, if that were possible, would it alter the idea of our ability? Well, in my backyard, I have some silicon life growing. It's called uh, horsetail reeds, and they use both cellulose and silicate as part of their uh, structure, just to kind of hold them upright. They're really quite, they call, I think called scouring brushes as well because of this uh, silicate coating. And uh, in under the microscope, I can see diatoms and diatoms have a beautiful uh, silicon exoskeleton. They exude silicon and uh, make a literally a glassy skeleton that protects them, protective device that they have. So silicon is part of life, but it's not part of the metabolism of life. And that's where carbon and its compounds with oxygen and nitrogen, that's when it comes into play. It has, it's so uh, robust and, um, you know, it will kind of uh, make chemical bonds with a vast number of other atoms, and by far the most important being oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur even, hydrogen, of course. Those are the biogenic elements. Silicon simply can't do that. Silicon is too tough in the kinds of bonds that it can form, and you can't break them down easily. You can't really dissolve uh, glass in a glass of water, can you? A little bit dissolves, but not much. So that is the real difference, I think, between silicon as a replacement for carbon. Certainly silicates, yes, glassy stuff, yes, but not metabolizable silicon. Now, my last question for you is a very simple one. As we boldly forge our way into the future, we begin to flirt with artificial life. What are your views on artificial life and should we be careful in creating it? Should we limit what we do? Okay, my colleague Jack Shostak has thrown himself into artificial life. He's literally trying to use biotechnology to put together a system of molecules that can reproduce itself and evolve in the laboratory. So this will be a technical version technical origin of life. I have a little bit different philosophy. I go out to volcanoes and try to understand how the first life must have begun in this kind of an environment. And uh, Jack's environment is really the laboratory. is very, very good at what he does. He won the Nobel Prize in 2009. In fact, he and I were editing a book, which uh, came out in 2010 together when, when he got the prize. And it was really kind of fun. I heard from other people that Jack just kind of got up, shrugged his shoulders and went off to the next committee meeting. <laughs> so there's no Eureka, it's, uh, that's just his personality. But Jack has just moved to the University of Chicago. I found out that yesterday, September 22nd, he became a faculty member, a university professor at the University of Chicago. And he's joined an Origins of Life program there, and uh, he's going to give life to it. He's going to really share a lot of knowledge he's built up. I've had a couple of students go to Jack's lab for postdoctoral studies, and it's unforgettable. It leaves a mark because uh, this is a very, very clever guy, and I respect him very much. So um, uh, this question of artificial life, I think we are going to get something in the laboratory. It's always 10 years away, five years away, 10 years away because, uh, you know, we're, just, we're optimistic. I just told you that I expect that we will get something that evolves in laboratory. 
I'm trying to get there in my own way as well. So it's going to happen. It's going to be, though, going back to Darwin's uh, letter, it's going to be very primitive and it's going to be a nutrient for any microbe in the in the uh, area. So uh, we have to keep that in mind in terms of any danger coming along. The dangerous things are life forms that already have evolved to become dangerous. These are the microbes that cause diseases. So what, have you had COVID yet? There's a dangerous a little viral particle. You know, it's just a little bit of RNA that takes over your cells and makes more of a protein that makes more of itself and goes around and around. So I don't think it's dangerous to do what we're doing. It's not as though something's going to crawl out like in science fiction movie and and uh, jump into the nearest human being. But I think it's a challenge. It forces us to think about how life could have begun. My challenge to Jack and the other people looking for technical approaches is let's take it out to Kamchatka and dump it into that little puddle, see whether it can grow there. And if it can, my hat's off. That's it. Absolutely amazing. It's just amazing to think that there are places on this earth where we can go and we can look at those where life may have began those those hydrothermal springs that that may have been the key to everything. Now, where can everybody learn more? Where can they find your books, Professor Deemer? Okay, I just, you brought this up, not me, so this is not the commercial, but you I just brought up the question of where can they find more? And on my shelf, I have a book that came out last year from Oxford University Press. It's called What Everyone Needs to Know About the Origin of Life. Its author is me. I was asked to do that by my editor because I had a book that came out a year before that called Assembling Life. And everything that has been in our conversation is in Assembling Life. And the origin of the, uh, every, what everybody needs to know, that is sort of a uh, Reader's Digest version of what I wrote there. And it really is. I try to be as clear as I could be. And every set of facts that I put there, there's a section at the end of each section called, how do we know? So I list the kinds of experiments, observations that underlie the facts. All right, Professor, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate it. Nothing fires my imagination more than abiogenesis. I can't learn enough, but I hope that we learn more within my lifetime. Thanks for, Same here. Thanks for appearing with us. Okay, very good. Bye now. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.